All right. So you got a lovely picture of my campus here in, in Duluth. This is what it looks like on the one day of the year. We don't have snow on the ground. Um, uh, how many of you guys have been to the University of Minnesota Duluth campus? One, C2, one, a couple. Yeah, my brother went there for three years. Oh, cool. Um, <clears throat> So we're going to talk about, I'd like to give a little bit of an introduction about myself, just because I know a few of you, but not all of you. And I always hate it when people are talking and they don't introduce themselves. So give a little bit of background information about who I am and who I am not. Um, so I'm going to talk about conspiracy theories today, but my actual education is in, in engineering. And so I'm not going to pretend that I'm ultra qualified on the subject of conspiracy theories. It's just something that I spend quite a bit of time uh, engaging people with off and on. And um, certainly in engineering, there's a lot of critical thinking involved and um, have to sort through a lot of data. That's part of our job. Uh, so um, that's the background that I'm coming from. My bachelor's and master's degrees are in mechanical engineering. And then, as we said earlier on, I went on late in life which I don't recommend for you all. Um, it's not the best move to go get your PhD when you're 40 um, and have a, a wife and kids and a job that you're trying to do, but um, was able to make it through that. And then the, the, the real reason for doing that is so that I could teach at the university and that's what I'm doing now. So I'm currently an assistant professor in civil engineering, um, but I also do a lot of work with mechanical engineering department at the university as well. And then this last year, I was promoted to director of our brand new advanced materials center there. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, but prior to all of the education uh, work now, I'm, I have a lot of engineering experience. I worked with Will, um, one of the best employees at Novatech Engineering. I don't know, Will, are you still at Novatech or no? Yes, yes. All right. You um, laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so he, um, I, I, I worked at Novatech for a short period of time, wasn't there real long, but I've had a number of different jobs and currently still operate my engineering consulting business, Crossroads Engineering Services, and I live in Emily, Minnesota. Anybody know where Emily is? Small nope. little town north of Brainerd, um, kind of, if you've heard of Crosby, if anybody likes mountain biking, Crosby are the best trails. I'm about uh, 12 miles north of Crosby. Well, I became a teacher. I just thought you might want to see a little bit of my history. My grandfather was probably my biggest influence on my life. Uh, this is a photograph of him in um, the Korean War. And uh, he wrote, took this picture. I love my grandpa. He took this picture and put a self timer on the back uh, uh, or put a self timer on his camera um, and then wrote on the back of the picture, uh, how can anyone hate them for a stick of gum? She thinks I'm the swellest guy in the world. And then he writes how he took the picture, which I always got a kick out of. So anyway, that's my grandfather. He, he traveled all around the world speaking at various uh, groups. Um, he is a really inspirational person to me. So um, uh, he was very passionate about education. Uh, one of his claim to fames, by the way, is he was, um, I'm just going to give you a quick tangent here. So uh, bear with me, but he was, um, traveling over in in Europe when he went to the the we see have the the uh, World's Fair I don't you know, know if they do that anymore but he was at this World's Fair in Europe and uh, was very very discouraged by the fact um he was there as a participant but also um he was with the military and was asked to go to this world world's fair and check things out and he was so embarrassed by the United States um pavilion that they had there. We just had a horrible display compared to other countries. And he was just embarrassed so much so that he, he sent a telegram to uh, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, President Eisenhower, and complained about it. And he got a response back almost immediately and saying, said, we are going to resolve this issue. I'm sending someone over. I'd like you to mentor him and be with him and, and show him how bad we are as the, a country and what we need to do to improve. Well, the person that he sent over was none other than Walt Disney. And so my grandfather was a, a personal tour guide for Walt Disney at this Brussels World Fair. And one of the things my grandfather was doing there was um, speaking and um, he was uh, co-teaching a course with um, a physics professor. And, uh, and this physics professor was like to use a bunch of analogies and illustrations and was kind of really dynamic. And my grandpa said, you know, I think this is one thing that Walt might like. So he brought Walt over to his, his physics show and said, I, you got to check this guy out. You'll like him. And um, 
anyway, that guy became the inspiration for the Nutty Professor. So um, that was my grandfather's colleague in, in at the Brussels World Fair. So anyway, very inspirational person in my life. The real purpose in my life now are my kids. Um, they're grown, believe it or not. When I used to talk to you guys over in Joppa years ago, these kids were still very, very small. Now my son just got married this summer. That's his beautiful bride on the right and my beautiful wife with me and, and my son at our wedding, his wedding this summer, which is a very small COVID <laughs> safe wedding, uh, immediate family only and outdoors. And then that's my daughter. She's a freshman now at uh, Calvin University where I did my uh, undergraduate. I also have these kids, a bunch of students, and that's really where my passions are at the university. And I get to go into labs with them, but also do a lot of industry work. So uh, Will, you would appreciate that we're trying to not only um, teach our kids to be good students and uh, excel in academia, but we're really trying to uh, develop a program that's um, reaching out to the industry so that they get some practical knowledge. So the picture on the right is my students working in one of our um, uh, partners labs at the university. And then what's been really, really fun is I'm uh, advising a number of mechanical engineering design teams. And uh, this is a cool picture. Uh, this photograph on the left is of me when I worked at Toro years ago it was my first job as an engineer. This was the prototype that I helped develop as a young engineer at Toro. And uh, it's an archaic uh, relic now, but it's in their hall of fame in their, in their hall. So they have it set up there because it really changed the ground for um, I was going to use the groundbreaking pun. It's a little um, walk behind skid steer loader, but it changed changed a lot of um, the industry. And we got a patent on that. The patent just expired a few years ago. So now other products, other uh, companies are making similar products. But what's really fun is these are all of my students. So um, we've been doing a lot of design work for them. And I get to bring my students back. And basically, they um, show up everything I ever did while I was at Toro. They're taking it way to the next level. And it's been really, really fun to, to be a part of that process. So that's just a bit of who I am. That's our new material center that we just built that I'm the director of. So OK. Enough about me. Oh, one more slide. So the other thing that I get involved with, and this is kind of where my passion is from a research standpoint, is um, environmental issues and specifically plastics. I've spent a lot of my career dealing with plastics. And one of the things we're trying to do is figure out ways to solve this problem, this plastic waste problem. And the, the research that I've done is focused on putting those products, those plastic waste shown here in the upper left hand corner, turning those into pellets and putting them into pipes that are going to serve a long time purpose. So these products here might either end up in a landfill or these are your laundry, laundry detergent bottles that you bring out hopefully to the recycling bins. Um, they might have a one year service life and we're turning in and turning them into products that will last 100 years underneath our highways. So I developed a service life model for those materials. And that's really the, the, the major area of my focus at the material center at the university. Any questions on my fun background before I start on conspiracy theories? Yes, what's your favorite of all of those? Who's asking the question? I didn't see the... Dan. Okay. Um, you know, you mean about all the jobs I've done or out of all the things I'm currently doing? Everything I, that you just told us. Okay. I would say by far the, the, the most favorite other than my family is the, the teaching aspect and working with students. There, there's no question I get way more joy out of that than anything I've done from a research standpoint or any of my, my personal accolades with regards to some of the projects I've worked on. You know, it's really fun to work on a project as an engineer and to develop a new product and to have be a part of that. That's a really fun and fulfilling thing, but it's nowhere near as fulfilling as helping coach somebody that's probably gonna be 10 times or is probably 10 times smarter than I ever was and uh, be a, just a small part of their influence to, to really make uh, give them the tools that they need to change the world. So for me, that's by far the, the funnest part of my job is the interaction and engagement with students. And I've been just beyond impressed with um, the quality of students we have at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And also just, you know, there's a lot of negative talk about younger generation Z and some of their attitudes. And I just see the opposite when I work with these engineering students. So that's, that's by far the, the most fun for me. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Anyone else? All right, so now what you really came to talk about, let's talk about conspiracy theories. Um, as a, just as an outset, 
the the intention here certainly is is by no means to um, talk down on different conspiracy theories or to talk down on anybody that might believe or, or support different theories. So that's not the purpose at all. It's more to talk about what can we do as Christians specifically to, to be critical thinkers? How do we navigate some of the misinformation that's out there? What are some tools that we can use to, to decipher the various um, theories that are being postulated? Um, and really, what is our responsibility as Christians in this day and age with regards to this topic of conspiracy theories? I mean, these have been around for a long, long time. There's multiple different conspiracy theories. Um, and it seems to me to be getting worse, but I'm not sure if that's really the case. It just might be that they're getting easier to spread. Uh, we have more information and information is easier to, to circulate with social media and with the internet today. So I think that that exasperates the issues, but uh, conspiracy theories have been around for a long, long time. So we're not going to talk about all of these. You see a number of them mentioned here. And again, if, if some of you want to um, try to convince me uh, that some of these theories are correct, uh, that's fine. We'll have a little bit of time for discussion as we move along. But the primary purpose here, again, is to kind of just um, talk about how, can, how we can think critically and how we can navigate um, these, these somewhat difficult topics. Sound good? Any questions before we dive in? No, I'm looking forward to this. All right. So I've, I've got a few guidelines and, and again, take these, I'm, please don't uh, take me wrong here. I'm not trying to come across as an expert on these areas. These are my thoughts. Again, my expertise is engineering, it's teaching. It's not so much um, uh, philosophy and it's not, um, I, don't, I don't claim to have any degrees or advanced degrees in conspiracy theories if there was one, um, but these are some of my thoughts. Uh, but I hope they're useful for, for our discussion together today. So I wanna just talk about a few different things. So, so some general guidelines um, for discerning truth. Um, three that I'd like to focus on. One is uh, consider the evidence. Two is consider the sources. And three is to consider Occ Occam's razor, which we'll talk about and I'll give you guys a chance to weigh in on that one. Um, and then I also want to close with some biblical guidelines. And there are four texts that kind of came to mind. Um, one, do not bear false witness against your neighbor um, in Exodus 20. Uh, two, don't be a gossip gossiper and slanderer. Uh, Romans 1 talks about that. We're going to spend most of our time on that one at the end. Um, third, love the Lord your um, your, love the Lord with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, you know, to me, this is an important one, maybe, maybe because my career has been spent in engineering and, and we're, we're paid to use our minds as much as possible in that field. But I think that there's just a lot of biblical truth that the Lord did give us minds. He does want us to think critically. And so part of the way that we love the Lord is not only um, with our emotions, but it's also with our mind and to, to use the intellect that he's given you to, to process information. And then um, not to take this one out of context, uh, but uh, the idea of testing everything. And um, once you test everything to hold fast to that, which is good. Um, that's what Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians. So those are some of the verses that um, we're going to discuss after we get through some of these general guidelines. So the first general guideline that I wanted to talk about was consider the evidence. So, you know, this is a hard one today because whatever theory we're talking about, there's evidence generally on both sides. But sometimes we need to think about evidence in quotes. What really is the evidence? Um, so we need to be really discerning of the evidence. And just because it was on the internet or just because somebody said this and spread it on social media, that doesn't necessarily mean it's evidence. There's a lot of, we need to do credibility tests. Is that evidence credible? Um, do we have really good reasons to trust it? Does it make sense? Um, are there also other explanations that make sense? So, so those are some of the questions that come to mind that, that we need to ask when we're, when we're evaluating different conspiracy theories or just general, any general truth. Uh, look for the evidence and weigh the evidence and see, see what it says. And we're going to discuss more of this as I go along. So I'm just giving you some high level considerations now before we talk together. Um, secondly is consider the sources. Where did you get the information? Um, you know, I'm a big guy, a, a big fan of reading both sides as much as possible. So if you're talking politics, go to Fox News, go to CNN, 
go to MSNBC, go to Newsmax, go to OANN, uh, go to, to multiple sources. And generally the truth is going to be somewhere in there. It's not going to be on the extremes. There are various media bias guides that you can find information that is kind of more central. Um, but don't be afraid to, to go to the extremes, but don't only go to the extremes. That's where I think we get ourselves into a lot of trouble. So, so where are your sources and where do they get their information? If you're going to only one of those extremes, what sources are that is that extreme using? Um, so um, in, when I say avoid extremes on both ends, it means don't only sit on those extremes. Go to the other side and, and look for other information. Um, engineers, I think, Will, you would agree, engineers are generally skeptical, I think. I mean, I'm, I've been a skeptic all of my life, so um, I think that, that skeptical, uh, a skeptical nature isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but there's a, a point where you can be too skeptical as well. But I think in general, to be skeptical of all information is a good characteristic because that's that's part of testing the truth and um, and testing the different theories. Um, trusting experts. This is an area where I get into a lot of deep discussions now is that there seems to be a, a general mistrust of experts, um, a view that experts are biased or that experts are a liberal or that, you know, even this, this happens to me a lot as a professor at the University of Minnesota is that, well, you're, you're certainly, um, you're, you must be sold out. You must be, um, you know, brainwashed by the, by the liberal, um, uh, liberal media or, or whatever, because you're at a public university and you're, 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 um, you're, you're biased, uh, towards the liberal bias. And it's just really not true. Um, you know, the, the peer review process is pretty, pretty intense. And we get, as researchers at universities, um, we are rewarded for new discoveries. So there's some thought process, I think, that says, well, uh, the experts, um, you, you can't think outside the box because if you think outside the box, your, your, your ideas are gonna get shut down right away. That the only thing that will ever get published is the prevailing theories. So, for example, people would say, well, a young earth creationist could never get published in a scientific journal because it's so biased against that person that he or she would never be able to publish because there's this bias towards uh, the prevailing theory of evolution, for example. And um, I, I just want to push back on that concept because really we are in the university encouraged more than anyone to, to be free thinkers and to really come up with new and innovative ideas. The problem is those new and innovative ideas have to pass a series of very, very critical tests. And so to get anything published goes through a very rigorous peer review process and that can be challenging but i don't think it's something that's keeping good or new information out rather it's just part of the scientific method and the scientific process of getting information through and so i would uh, challenge anyone that says you have to be always skeptical of experts because they're just uh, giving you the information that they're you know um, being controlled to give if you will and I just don't think that that's the truth. It certainly hasn't been my experience. We've been more than encouraged in the university to, to develop new and innovative materials and ideas and processes and, and thoughts and theories. Um, but those, those new theories and those new ideas really need to be evaluated very, very carefully. And so um, I think we have good reason to trust the experts. And I think it's also good for, for you as you're reviewing information to see who has reviewed the information that you're receiving. So. Um, go to published articles, to, to peer-reviewed journals, if possible, to get your information. Um, it's going to be much more healthy than just random facts on the internet. Any questions on that one before I go further? Yeah, it's Dan again. I got a question here. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible for someone to be of a sound approach to... Uh, to the uh, creation and still be old earth, but not evolutionists either, but old earth creationists. Yeah, for like sure. I would are... say, I'd say the majority of my, my Christian friends in this field are old earth creationists that would not support um, an evolutionary theory, for example. Um, they would support one of the other theories, um, and, and I'd be happy to talk about that in more detail at another time. Might be a good follow-up talk, but um, definitely, there's a lot of old Earth 
uh, creationists that I know that that believe in an old earth, believe in various, um, you know, that um, the universe is 14.7 billion years old and the earth is four and a half billion years old, um, but believe that God created everything and that he did so in a, in a way that's in, in agreement with Genesis 1. Um, and there's different theories on how they could. And I, I don't, you know, frankly, at, at, at the University of Minnesota, for example, I would say maybe 30% of the faculty member, maybe a little bit less that I engage with on a day-to-day -day basis are believers, Christians, um, and the majority are not. But um, I have never once felt any persecution or any pushback for uh, my beliefs at that university, uh, whether it's coming from somebody that believes in in God or not, um, they they allow they they know where I stand on on issues like creation, and as long as it doesn't interfere with the way I conduct my class or or, or do research, you know, it, it's it's nothing that I've gotten uh, a pushback on. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions on that? All right, let's spend a little bit of time on Occam. Uh, anybody. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but somebody give me a, 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 a review or a, a paragraph or a sentence or so that would summarize what Occam's razor says. If you hear hoofs, think horses, not zebras. There you go. That's a very good one. Anybody else have a thought? Is this the, the, the saying that goes, uh, all things considered the, the, the easiest or the most obvious tends yep. to be the right one. Yep. Is that yep. what that means? Yep, okay. exactly. So I've got a couple of videos. I don't think I'll, I'll, the, I'll play the first one because it's a funny short one and then we'll go on to the, um, I'll skip the other one. I'll just share, share it in the link and you can look at it on, on your own, but hopefully my sound comes through here. You guys hear that? Okay. It's now painfully yeah. Way for an invasion by the saucer people. You fool! Can't you see it's a massive government conspiracy? Or have they gotten to you too? Why are you guys jumping to such ridiculous conclusions? Haven't you ever heard of Occam's razor? The simplest explanation is probably the correct one. So what's the simplest explanation? I don't know. Maybe they're all reverse vampires and they have to get home before dark. All right. So I have one other video, but again, it's about a five minute one and I don't want to take the time to show it. But yeah, basically the theory says this, that the uh, all things else, all, all things being equal, the, the best solution is probably the simplest. Um, there's, there's been a number of different um, paraphrases of that, um, of, of Occam, Occam's razor, but in general, that's what it is. And why is it important with regards to conspiracy theories? Well, a lot of times we have to evaluate multiple um, answers or multiple solutions or multiple hypotheses. And uh, the theory of Occam's razor is, it, again, it's not really a, um, a it's a, more of a principle. It's not, it's not like a, a law. So there's no, no law that this guides, but it's really used in, in the scientific method and in, in, in engineering practice every day. Um, and it's just is, is saying that, you know, the simplest, most elegant solution usually is the best. As Jeff said, um, you know, if you, if you hear uh, hoof, uh, what was your phrase, Jeff? Say it again. If you, if you hear hoofs, uh, think horses, not zebras. Right. I mean, horses are a lot more common and they're a lot more prevalent. And so likely what you're hearing is horses, you're not hearing a zebra, even though they would both give the same sound. Um, unless you're maybe in the middle of Africa, you might have reason to believe it's going to be a zebra. So, um, but, but a lot of times conspiracy theorists tend to look for these these far out solutions. And in reality, there might be a much more elegant and a much uh, simpler solution that, that would explain the problem much, much easier. So as just a couple of examples, one of the projects I work on with my Toro students is this, um, we developed for, for, for Toro, a uh, remote controlled or autonomous uh, vehicle that's uh, supposed to inspect golf courses for divots uh, which are, are um, basically divots are, um, how many of you guys golf? Not many hands up, I don't see. Uh, 
divots are formed when you uh, when you hit the ball, you should take out a little bit of turf. So these are simulated divots that I'm circling with my arrow, with my pointer. Um, and basically golf courses have issues because they want to fill those divots with sand because they will um, then grow back and you don't want a golf course that's completely torn up with divots. And that's a pretty time consuming process. So uh, one of the things that we developed for them was this this autonomous vehicle that would uh, drive around the golf course and has a camera system built into it that looks for divots. And when it finds one, um, it meters a certain amount of sand into the into the divot and we'll move on to the next one. It's basically like a big Roomba that's um, going around golf courses. So anyway, why am I bringing this to this example up? Well, one of the things we often talk about and Will can attest to this as his engineering design as well is it's, it's pretty important to try to come up with simple solutions that are still elegant and get the job done. But if you can, if you can uh, do things that are um, less complex, generally you're better. But we, we like to have, we start with this brainstorm idea of ideas where you have these really um, elaborate, all solutions are, are on the table, right? You throw everything out there. And you start slowly funnel those ideas down until you come up with one that is implementable, that's practical, that'll get the job done, and hopefully that's elegant and cost effective. And so, for example, uh, one of the features on this, this unit was this, this crude smoothing device on the back end of it. The students went through multiple iterations on how to develop something that's going to smooth out the divots. And it, it, it included some rotating discs, like an inverted Frisbee that would spin around and rotate. It included uh, some inflatable air bladders that would uh, distribute an equal pressure on the soil. All of these, these crazy ideas, and I say crazy because that's how a good engineering practice is done. But in the end, you find something that's going to work and going to be elegant, simplicity in design. Here's another um, image that talks about this. Uh, anybody know what this picture is? The I-35? Yeah, I-35. Yeah, the I-35 yep. like, collapse of the bridge. Yep, uh, the I-35 collapse. So I was, um, I'm actually good friends with the, the bridge and the state bridge engineer who is in charge of the Minnesota uh, uh, bridges and structures. Uh, his name is Dan Dorgan. Um, this was a tough day for him. I called him uh, as soon as this happened. And uh, I'll tell you that he's never been the same since this, this occurred. It wasn't his fault per se, but he was the state bridge engineer. So these fell under his jurisdiction. Anybody remember how this bridge collapsed? No, I was in Austria when it happened. Oh, really? Okay. I guess you wouldn't remember then. There, there was a, a gusset that, um, uh, had corroded over time. And so there's actually a few gussets. And in bridge design, we do something uh, called redundancy, where if, if one component on a bridge fails, uh, we have a redundant design to ensure that um, the bridge will still be stable. Um, older designs lacked redundancy. And uh, in this case, there was a, a gusset that had corroded over time and the inspection criteria really weren't what they should have been on this bridge. And so over time, um, that gusset failed and it caused, a, um, we had the right lo traffic loading on the bridge at the uh, perfect storm event and it caused the thing to collapse. Mm -hmm. um, I bring this up because if, you, if we're gonna, you know, we did a lot of analysis to find out why this bridge collapsed and you could postulate all kinds of different theories. Ultimately, we know that it was down to this gusset, but somebody could have said, well, maybe maybe somebody uh, uh, blew it up or maybe somebody, uh, you know, painted explosive paint onto the bridge and over time they detonated it at a certain time. Anyway, there's, there's multiple theories that we could come up with, but generally speaking, uh, engineering principles are engineering principles and we can trace those, those uh, theories back to um, reality and find out what caused it to fail. And that's part of the forensic analysis. So again, um, these things aren't necessarily that complicated of things to, to, to find out, but in a tragedy like this, everybody wants an explanation. And a lot of times people, for some reason, gravitate towards those explanations that um, uh, might be more exotic, <laughs> and, uh, but certainly don't get us closer to the truth. So let's talk about some of these other theories. Which one of these would you like to talk about? You guys pick. Let's go with the most uh, recent one. 
sporting irregularities? Might as well. All right. <laughs> so again, there's a lot of theories out there, right, with regards to the election and that there was a fraudulent election. And we've seen some anecdotal evidence, certainly, that there has been some fraud. I think there is in every election. Um, we've got uh, allegations against the um, Dominion counters and the, the, the software that was used. Uh, we have allegations of, of vote dumps of, you know, hundreds of thousands of votes changed. Um, you know, so do we, do we give those theories, uh, how much weight should we give those theories? Or is there a lot of credibility? What would be some of your answers? How would you approach that, that one? I, I'm, I'm interested in hearing some of your thoughts on this. Uh, yeah, I think that there is something to be said about confirmation bias. We support a, a particular candidate a lot. So we want him to win. And so we see we see the results through that lens. He's got to win. He's got to win. Mm -hmm. And we discount things that go against our what we're looking through our, that lens we're looking through. Right. Is that could that be valid? I think it's extremely valid. Very mm -hmm. valid. Yeah. Both both and that goes both ways, right? That goes both ways. Yeah. I th I think it also matters what you're taking in to kind of piggyback off of Dan's point there. Uh, what your sources are because you mentioned all those different news outlets and uh each news outlet uh some have different biases than others and some are more extreme biases than others but if that's what you're taking in odds are if you're just exclusively taking that in odds are that's what you're also willing to put out and then the other element of of that dynamic is once you've spoken that out you've kind of married yourself to that viewpoint. So you're, you're, you're in for a dime, you're in for a dollar. Right. Um, and so that just kind of snowballs on itself. Yeah. I agree completely. Yeah. Any other thoughts? I, I'm thinking um, whether it be voting irregularities or most current events, cause I don't think the conspiracy about the world trade center, or I'm not sure what pizza gate is. Um, I'm guessing they're older, <laughs> but um, I think what's so tough about um, current events is it does seem that we aren't getting, it's very hard to find, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It seems like there's extreme information. It's, it's, it doesn't seem like we're getting any non-biased information. Um, and it's hard to find. And then you become skeptical if, if it's it, wondering if it is biased. So I think, I think the conspiracy theories, you know, talking about what Dan said, yeah, there's people who want their man to win. Um, so there's creating some of these theories, but we've just been in a, I think this last year has been hyper, hyper <laughs> information and misinformation. So it's hard to find where is the, the healthy middle ground <laughs> information wise. <laughs> I think that's a, a very, very good point, Karen, because it's, I mean, like, like, like Jeff said, too, if you go to um, Newsmax or you go to uh, Fox News sometimes, I mean, they're kind of, <laughs> they're, they've, they've gotten on Trump's bad side now, but uh, you, you'll find one story and you go to another site and you'll find another story. So how do you discern what's, what's true and what isn't? I think finding data is difficult. Um, but one of the things I think would I would say is with regards to um, anybody follow what went on in Georgia. In reference to what? Suitcases. Let's talk a little bit. Well, suitcases was one. Let's talk a little bit about Dominion. Dominion is the the uh, the software company that that did the electronic counts, and there was accusations that Dominion had somehow programmed their machines. Um, to, to flip votes and to see, you know, when, when a certain number of Trump votes are coming in to flip them to Biden. And there was this accusation that all of Dominion machines then were, were compromised and that this was some wide scale thing that was being done. But when you looked at the data, um, Georgia was a state that used Dominion machines for their electronic counting. Um, but Georgia also then was forced to do a manual recount and then forced to do another electronic recount. 
And there were some discrepancies, but they weren't at all related to the Dominion machines. They were related to an error in one of the uh, human error in one of the counting situations. And it had zero effect on the outcome of, of the, the race in Georgia. So, so when we hear things like, well, the, all of these Dominion machines are compromised, um, the one example that they had to really prove this was in Georgia and it did not prove out. And so, you know, then you start to say, well, we should take that theory maybe with a grain of salt. There's another county in, in Michigan now that they're claiming had, uh, you know, 78% or something error rate on their Dominion machines. But again, the data is coming out that that was human error, not Dominion error. And even if it was Dominion error in that case, it was about 4,000 votes out of 150,000 or so that um, decided the election. So, you know, that's part of being discerning, I think, with our information is saying really what is going on. And then the other thing that we've talked about earlier is trusting the experts. I mean, I know this is a hard one to do, but honestly, if you've got 60 some lawsuits and multiple courts, even conservative, conservative majority courts deciding against fraud and saying that it wasn't on a wide scale basis, don't we have to take that with, with you know, some, some sense of security that, okay, um, this has gone through the system and has been tried and it came out even maybe, maybe not in favor of the person that you or I wanted or some people wanted to win, but you know, don't we still trust that? Do you uh, do you think we just talked about this about a month ago? We had a, a, a video from Brant Hansen, and he included a verse from uh, Proverbs eighteen. Proverbs eighteen seventeen uh, says, "The first to speak in court sounds right until cross examination begins." And I, I think a lot of what's happening with these is uh, you get the accusation. It's almost like you get the error in reporting. And then the retraction is so much smaller and so much it's the headlines on the front page, but the retractions towards the back, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so the first, the first testimony you hear is the accusation and the cleanup process isn't as, isn't as sexy. Uh, so it doesn't catch our attention as much. And so when the truth is buried in the cleanup, it makes a lot, it makes a lot more work for us to discern what's what. Right. I agree with you completely. I think that that's, that's, that's tough. And we don't get all of the information, right? A lot of times we don't even see that follow up information, you really have to dig like I've gone so far as to, to actually read the, um, a number of the affidavits that have been filed a number of the um, lawsuits I've read through the depositions I've read through, you know, sometimes these are, are a long time, and I don't have frankly have the time to, to deal with it like I'd like to. But the information is there a lot of times if you go to it, but you have to be careful that you go to the right source and that you read through the right information and then make your own judgment on it. But in this case, you know, the other thing that that they'll often say is, well, um, how is it possible that President Trump got 75 million votes and lost? That seems absurd. You know, he only had 60 some million votes last time and he got that many more and still lost. There's no way that that's possible. But what's a what's a response to that? What would be your your logical response to that allegation? Whatever the electoral college means, it's I don't understand, but that's got to have something to do with it. Well, I don't know. I don't know how that works. Who, how does the electoral have to do with it? But but I mean, the fact that he got seventy some million votes isn't it? Isn't it also a plausible answer that this election had a greater voter turnout than ever we've had in, in recent history? And wouldn't that make some sense? I mean, let's let's be honest. Regardless of whether you like President Trump or not, um, he was a pretty divisive figure in our in our country, and there was a lot of people that came out to both to support him and also to overthrow him. So just because he got that many votes, I don't think it's good reason to say that he won must have won the election then. Um, because we know that voter turnout was much, much higher. I mean, to to the credit of people who, who make that point, though, 75 million votes in a typical election does win you that election. Yep, no uh, question. So so it's it's not a stretch on someone's common sense to uh, to go like, hey, maybe there was something here. But it, as you as you point out with another piece of common sense, uh, the voter turnout so much higher that you have to take that into the equation as well. Yeah. Exactly. Something. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No. I was just going to say something that I noticed, especially throughout the course of like election day and like the week after was that a lot of people are confused about basic math. 
Um, I saw a lot of people posting things that were like, you know, Trump has 2000 more votes in this in Michigan, but according to the percentages, it's the same. Why is that? It's like, well, if you round to a, to the 10th of a percent and not, you know, a hundredth or more, sometimes you're going to get where the 10th, the percent is the same when you're looking at millions, you know, you're dividing 2000 by millions, you're going to get really close numbers. Yeah. Yep. Agreed completely. That's uh, there's, there's no question about that. And then the other thing to consider is, is, you know, this was a unique election. We had um, a pandemic. We've never had an election during a pandemic like this. Uh, and we knew that mail-in voting was going to change things. Uh, President Trump was pretty clear he didn't trust mail-in voting from the outset, so he encouraged everybody that supported him to come and vote in person. A lot of people that were on the other side felt that it was safer and better to vote uh, through mail-in. So there was no surprise really that uh, President Trump was leading a number of these states. And then uh, as the mail-in votes were counted the next day or later at night, uh, things started to switch. So that kind of could lead some people to say, oh, well, something's going on there. How in the world can you flip a state so quickly? Um, but there's also a very reasonable explanation as to how that happened in this case. And uh, again, that's part of being discerning, I think, with our data and um, and and saying what what explanations are there? Um, is it is it more likely that a bunch, 100,000 uh, mysterious ballots showed up and were dumped uh, in favor of Biden? Or is it more likely that uh, the majority of the mail-in ballots were Democrat in nature and therefore uh, swung the vote over? And there's ways to test that too, by the way. Um, one of the things you say, well, if 100,000 votes were dumped in a certain county that swung it, um, then you would think that that county would have a, you know, a greater percentage of, of voters than it did previously. And generally, all of those major counties that um, had, had those, those allegations actually had a lower um, percentage of increase to, to Biden uh, than, than in the previous 2016 election. So anyway, there's, there's ways to sort through that data, I guess is what I'm saying. And that's part of this process of being discerning. So, so when you're sorting this out and you're using discernment and how do you apply the evidence from, from like a Christian worldview, how do you apply the evidence either in a public venue or, or even a simulated public venue like social media or, or within like your circle of friends? What's the, what's, what do you recommend there? Yeah, you know, I think that's, that's a good, that's a, actually a good lead in into where I kind of wanted to end this, you know, um, <laughs> One of the things a lot of people can say, well, what's what's the harm in some of these conspiracy theories or why, you know, what, what's the big deal? What I think is the, the most damaging thing is the fact that um, we're often tearing one another down in the process and we're not really being good examples of our Christian influence. Um, so I wanted to draw attention to Romans 1 verse 28 through 31. And it's basically a catch-all, <laughs> you know, it says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. That's a pretty exhaustive list. And there's, if, if you know, I see numerous uh, adjectives that jump out at me and say, boy, I've done that, or I, I'm, I'm guilty of that. And, um, the, you know, gossips and slanderers jump out. It's really easy to throw stones and to say this person is evil or this person had, you know, ulterior motives. And this isn't just for the election. This is for other theories too. And Karen, I'm glad you don't know what Pizzagate is. I encourage you not to look into it because it's it's ridiculous. But it, it, you'll see in it's it's much more widespread than you than than anybody would think with regards to the, the promulgation of some of these theories and it's really easy to say really bad things about people um, accusing of them of being part of some nefarious scheme or some some awful evil plan without having sufficient evidence for the allegation. And really that is not something where I think Christians should be. We should have no part of gossip. We should have no part of slander. We should have no part of saying 
bad things about people when we don't have evidence, um, sufficient evidence for that. Even if you do have evidence, we should watch our tongues. And so I think that's where we've really gotten into problems and especially in social media, because it's so easy to type nasty comments towards people, other people that have a different viewpoint than us. Um, it's easy to type negative comments towards um, our officials. You know, um, I'm, I, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm not a President Trump supporter. I did not vote for him either time. Um, I did not like his personality or his character. I thought it was, um, he was um, wrong for our country. That said, he was our president and I acknowledge that and treated him with respect um, as much as I could. I refer to him as President Trump. Um, he was our president. He did win the election and he deserves that respect. Um, so, so we can disagree with people in a respectful manner. Um, we don't need to, I, I always hated when people would call pres, uh, President Obama, Obama or other names, or, and I don't like when people call President Trump, Donnie or wh whatever. It, just be careful with our language as Christians that we're using. And especially as we engage with, with um, non-Christians, um, we, we are really, the, 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 the light is shining bright on us. And it's just so important that we are the, the influence, in my opinion, and the example that we need to be. And so uh, come back to Romans 1, 28 through 31, as you're trying to engage with people on conspiracy theories and other things, and just say, am I being uh, a gossiper in this case? Am I being slanderous? Am I being haughty? Am I being boastful? I've been accused many times of being boastful, and it's something that I've had to check in, in the way I write. Um, I'm generally a fairly confident person, and I think it comes off poorly a lot of times in the way I write. So I re read and reread what I write many times to say, is this coming across as arrogant? Because uh, that's really not my intent. And even as I'm engaging with you, I hope you're not sensing arrogance because it's really not. It's, it's more, how can we engage with one another in a meaningful and constructive way? So what are your thoughts? Any 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 comments? I know we went a little bit long here and um, we didn't go into depth on a lot of conspiracy theories, but uh, I, I'd, I'd really like to hear some of your thoughts on this matter. Well, one thing I would like to encourage you guys with and also just kind of warn you guys with, um, like Karin mentioned, uh, not knowing what Pizzagate was. And that's totally okay that you don't know that stuff. But like, if you start to search this stuff after seeing it, um, especially on YouTube, algorithms will start popping up similar vi videos. And so don't start going too deep down some of those rabbit trails um, because uh, the sources get a little looser and looser the further you go. Uh, so just be aware that you guard what you're taking in and balance it out. Like, and that's not some boogeyman stuff. Like that's like legitimately research stuff that I've come across. And man, if you've ever wondered why you, you searched once for something for Christmas and all of a sudden it's all over your Facebook feed, that's algorithms. Um, so just know that if you're doing some research on some of these things, um, there, there's some fringe stuff the further down you go that you need to use your discernment with and use some wisdom on. Um, so that, that'll be my one cautionary tale behind some of the things we're talking about tonight. I agree completely, Jeff. And it's easy to get sucked in and it's easy to get sucked in and start reading more and more. And then um, I tell you, there's, there's a lot of I mean, some of you may may have read a lot of these conspiracy theories. Some of you maybe believe in a lot of them. Um, if not, I guarantee you that you have friends that are deep into some of this. And um, whether it's the the 9-11 was an inside job, um, I've got multiple friends that swear up and down that we were not under attack. Um, this was something that was our government that that um, that, it, that blew up those buildings. And um, I've, I've had people send me hours worth of videos to watch and analyze. And I frankly don't have time to watch all of it, but I generally try to be respectful of people and give them some honest thoughts. So that's one other thing I'll say is, if you are approached by somebody with a conspiracy theory that you don't quite know how to decipher and understand, I'd encourage you to, to seek out people that either are knowledgeable about that on the other side so that you get some information. You'd be surprised how many people I have uh, messaged me, private message me um, on a number of these types of topics saying, what are your thoughts on this? 
And generally I will give them my thoughts, just what they are, my opinions based on how I would see the data. Um, but that can be a useful tool. And I, I'm more than happy to, if, if any of you have questions that you wanna take offline, shoot me a message and I'd be more than happy to engage in the discussion. What would you prioritize uh, in, in an interaction that has differing views? What, what are your priorities entering into a disagreement, we'll say? You know, um, it, it, it's a really good question. I've had, I've got a, a friend of mine who I do triathlons with that is really, um, he's a Christian, he's a believer. So one, I'll preface it that way. If the person is a Christian, my response is a lot different than if they're not a Christian. So the, 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 the way I engage with people is different. And that's because um, I think Christians uh, are, are called to hold each other, one another up to a higher standard. And the, the, we, we're coming from the same background. So, um, so I have a, a friend that's a, a Christian and he's a, a huge uh, Trump supporter. I haven't quite understood how he can be as much of a supporter as he is. And, and I, I voted for um, on the other side on this election and he knew that. And he would go so far as to say that I can't be a Christian and vote for a Democrat uh, over the pro-life issue, for example. And so we've had a lot of, I think, helpful dialogues. I don't know if we've made a lot of progress, but the, the one theme that I've always tried to do is to, to, to dialogue in grace. Don't name call. Don't judge him. I, I try not to judge him or his motives. And I would ask that he doesn't judge mine. I don't like it when people, when he calls me and says, basically implies that I can't be a Christian and believe that that's, to me, that's a worse attack than anything else. Um, you know, Dr. Francis, I'll, I'll give you one illustration. Um, Dr. Francis Collins is a person that I really like. He's the head of the NIH, um, but he's also a Christian. Um, he happens to believe that God created the world through an evolutionary process and, and, and believes in the evolutionary model, uh, but he's a born again Christian. He gets under attack on both sides. He gets really attacked by the scientific community because he's very outspoken in his Christian faith. He gets really attacked by the Christian community because he believes in evolution. And uh, I was at a conference one time and they asked him which of those two is worse. And he said, by far the attacks from Christians. And it's because they were attacking the, his fundamental Christian faith. He said, it's one thing to attack my, my scientific beliefs or my scientific knowledge, but to question my faith is hurtful. And I would say the same. So if you're engaging in these discussions with other Christians, be respectful of one another. Everybody's in a different situation. Everybody sees things from a little bit different side. So just be really respectful. And if you're engaging with a non-Christian, I think even more so even more respectful, more grace, know that they're not coming from the same perspective that you are. And so therefore it's even more important to show that grace and to, to really engage in a way that's um, um, gracious towards his or her beliefs and, and, um, and listen, listen more than talk. Anyone else have any questions? I've got one closing illustration for you then. That's a, many of you guys know, I do a lot of triathlons. Um, anybody remember how long the Ironman triathlon is? You, you swim, you bike and run. How long is the swim? Three miles. It's well, two point something. Yep. 2.4 miles. And then we bike. Uh, this is in Hawaii a few years ago at the world championship there when I was riding that course. Anybody remember how long the bike is? 13 miles. 100. 100 miles? 111. <laughs> one, 112. <laughs> 112 miles nonstop. Yeah, 112 miles nonstop. And then we transition to a run. Anybody know how far the run is? 26 miles. That's good. It's a marathon. It's 26.2. Don't forget the point two because believe me, point two hurt. Um, so, so I've done, uh, Lord willing, I'm going to be doing my 20th full distance Ironman this summer, but, but the best one I ever did, by far the best one was this one. And this was in, in, um, uh, Lake Placid, uh, Lake Placid, New York. I had the privilege of, of serving as a guide for this man, Charlie Plascon. And Charlie was 66 years old at the time that I guided him completing this Ironman as a blind athlete. So we were tethered together on the swim. Uh, we were, we rode tandem on the bike. This is a snapshot my wife took as we were rounding one of the corners. Um, and of course, guess who's up front and guess who's behind? 
Um, you better hope the guy with the eyes is in front uh, and Charlie's behind, but we're both pedaling. And uh, the bike was really interesting because it's a 112 mile course, like I said, but um, the first nine miles of the course are uphill. And then you go to a six, uh, this is in the, the, the mountains in New York. So it's a really hilly course. So the first nine miles are uphill. And then we go to a six mile downhill. And I tell you, you've got two people on a tandem bike going downhill. Uh, we hit 54 miles per hour. And uh, we got to the bottom of the, the hill and Charlie quipped to me, boy, I'm so glad that I'm blind because I would have been scared to death if I could see. Um, but it, it was really a fun time blasting through this course with him. But the reason it was my, my favorite course and my favorite experience is just because the opportunity to, um, to be his eyes and to do this race uh, for him. Uh, you know, when we crossed the finish line and throughout the whole race, we all wore a race number. We have this bib with our number on it, but we had one number. We were one racer. We had one number and one name. Uh, if you look at the finish, uh, finish results for um, Ironman Lake Placid in 2010, you won't find Mike Plummer in there. You'll find Charlie Plascon. And I was his, simply his eyes for the race. I did the whole race with him, but I was his eyes. And I tell you, there's no better way to, to, to go through life than try to serve somebody like that and to be a part of their walking with them through this, this, their, their adventure in life. And, um, that's really what we're called to do as Christians is to be servants and to be a light to those around us. And I think with conspiracy theories, we have an opportunity to do that too, to speak truth into people, to, to be their eyes if they're struggling seeing things. Not to say we're always going to get it right, but certainly we can steer them to, to the real answer, the true answer, and that's Jesus Christ. So I just want to encourage you today to, to be that light. And uh, this is the, the, what I often will tell my students when I tell this story. Think about whose name is on your bib. Whose name, who are you racing for? Are you racing simply for yourself? Are you going through life simply for yourself? Or do you have something greater in mind? Maybe it's Hopefully, um, for the Christian, we're all racing for Christ, but we can also race and serve others in that process. So, so be thinking about that. Who, why do you do what you do? Why do you get up each morning and, and go through life? Who are you serving and how can you serve better in your life? And that, that's my challenge to us today.